Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with road music number two, driving to Bach, in this case, the Goldberg Variations. Now, a lot of you asked me to do a talk on the Goldberg Variations, and I'm sure you want to know what the best and the worst and the this and the that, and on piano and on harpsichord and blah, 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 blah. Right? Here's the problem. The Goldberg Variations is one of those iconic works that has so many fine recordings. It's not really possible to talk about the best or even, even the 10 best. We're talking about literally dozens. So I have come up with a better way to deal with the Goldberg Variations, to talk about some of my favorite recordings. And so some of those I also think are generally considered to be among the best out there. And more to the point, to have new reasons to listen to the damn things, because you know you know them. I mean, Hannibal Lecter listened to them in The Silence of the Lambs when he was in his cage. He was listening to Glenn Gould do the Goldberg Variations. I mean, everyone knows the Goldberg Variations, but this selection, I think, will give you some reasons to listen to different versions of them in a way which is perhaps uh, not typical, because I'm talking about listening to them when you're driving. Now, we already did one talk about road music. It involved the Delib ballets, Coppelia and Sylvia, which are marvelous, going back and forth to Connecticut. And well, I went back and forth again. And this time, I was listening to Goldberg Variations. And one of the wonderful things about the Goldberg Variations is because it comes with repeats, which you can observe or not observe, its length can vary enormously. It can vary anywhere from, oh, more than an hour and a half to about 32 to 40 minutes. I mean, really, it's kind of astonishing. It depends how fast you go and how many repeats you observe. So it also depends on where you're headed. And so one of the things I've done is I've picked these performances because they offer an enormous range of length. Whatever the timing of your trip, there is a Goldberg Variations for you. And then I have divided them into, into piano versions and harpsichord slash period instrument versions or other instruments because there are other options as well for that. So I'm going to talk about these performances from the from in the order of shortest to longest within their various categories. And let's see what happens. It's kind of interesting. I had I had a whopping good time putting these lists together. I have 15 different versions of the Goldberg variations, eight for uh, box instruments and seven on piano. And let's see how they shake out. But before we start with the recordings, I do want to say one thing about the piece. For those of you who do not know the Goldberg Variations, it is, it is one of the, the great keyboard works in the history of Western civilization. It consists of an aria that Bach wrote, and then 30 variations of that aria, and then a repeat of the aria at the very end. And the thing that gets varied is not the tune. The tune of the aria is not important. What is important is the bass line, the underlying harmonies that support the tune, because that is the subject of the variations. And you may say to yourself, well, you know, how do I hear the variations? Well, the answer is most of the time you don't. What you hear is, is the direction that the harmony goes as each half of the tune is repeated. And one of the things that Bach said, well, C.P.E. Bach said it, his son, which I'm sure was a quotation of his father. It's a very interesting idea that's worth keeping in mind when you listen to the Goldberg Variations. What C.P.E. Bach said is that melody is simply the surface expression of an underlying scheme of harmonies. You have a harmonic progression, and you want to make that harmonic progression expressive. You want it to mean something emotionally. And so you write a tune on top of it that fits those underlying harmonies, but they're related to each other in that respect. So that, so that when you listen to these variations, what you are hearing is the, the expressive variations of the underlying scheme of harmonies. Now, the other thing that's fascinating about the Goldberg variations is that every third variation is a canon. Now, a canon 
as you may know, is around. It's it's one melody which follows the other a fixed distance away, like like row your boat, you know, for example. That's a canon, and every single third variation is a canon, but the intervals at which those canons occur rise with each variation. So first, the first canon is the one at the unison. It's row your boat. It's the same tune on one hand and then in the other hand. The next one is at the second. They're a little bit apart, then a third, then a fourth, then a fifth, then a sixth. They go up and up and up and up and up until you get to, I think, the ninth is the last one. Very, very, very interesting and very expressive. In fact, one of the most the most emotionally gripping and saddest of all the variations is the 15th, which is a canon. And these are, it's the canon at the fifth. And it's really, it's really extraordinarily expressive. So that's just about all you need to know about the Goldberg Variations. And yeah, you just go listen to it. And you can listen to it as long as you want. And it'll last as long as you want. Put it on in your car and start driving. We have a wonderful range of performances that cover a fabulous range of distances. So let's begin. First, the two shortest. And here, instead of dividing it between harps and chord and piano, I've got one of each. One of the shortest is the classic Gustav Leonhardt. Leonhardt was a Bach specialist, one of the fabulous early exponents of Bach on period instruments, and a harpsichord master. And this is his Deutsche Harmonia Mundi recording of the Goldberg Variations. He was a master, and he doesn't take many repeats. It only takes 47 minutes. It's wonderfully brief. So if you're not in the mood to really stretch out or your trip isn't going to take longer than 47 minutes, here you go. Now for the piano, the fastest famously is the immortal 1955 mono Glenn Gould Goldberg variations. This one is, is like, well, it's like 40 minutes maybe 42 minutes, maybe it's like the quickest ever done. It has no repeats and it goes like the wind. It's fabulous. And it's an iconic performance. Some people hate it. Who cares what they think? It's magnificent. It made his reputation um, as one of the great pianists of the 20th century. And this is an absolutely magnificent recording. So Glenn Gould, 55. That's the one you've got to think about. That's the quick one. He remade it later on, doing some repeats. It's a considerable amount slower, but, you know, it's also very good if you want to get that one, too. It was a digital recording, but this is the one to get if you're in a hurry, and it's very good for that reason. Now, let's start talking about piano versions. Now, the piano versions are, generally speaking, um, they run the gamut from, from you know, 70 minutes to 80, 80 and a bit minutes, usually. Some of them maybe even a bit longer, but these are all really fine recordings. 71-ish minutes is Andras Schiff. Now, he also did it twice. There's a Decca recording um, that was his first version, but this is the ECM live remake, which I think is a little a little perkier and it has maybe a little bit more interest and spontaneity than his studio version, as is often the case with live recordings. So Andras Schiff on ECM is one option for your Goldberg variations if your trip is lasting 70 plus a few minutes. After that, at 73 minutes, we have Murray Pariah. Murray Pariah's Sony recording of the Goldberg Variations received enormous acclaim when it was released, and justly so. It is magnificently well played, beautifully recorded, extremely poetic and sensitive. And you know, he's one of those guys who was really able to sustain the two dark, slow variations, numbers 15 and 25, without dragging them out to the point where, where if you were Count Kaiserlink, you're ready to pass out. Count Kaiserlink was the guy who commissioned the Goldberg Variations. Goldberg was his harpsichordist. And the idea was he had insomnia, and so he wanted a big, long piece that he could 
that was not going to put him to sleep, that was going to keep him awake because he couldn't go to sleep. That was the idea behind the Goldberg Variations as the story goes. And we don't want a version that's going to put you to sleep. And Murray Pariah is just, just beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Another fascinating version worth hearing, also kind of a classic in its day, Charles Rosen. This was a Sony recording originally. This is the reissue of it on Newton Classics. Charles Rosen was one of those genius, you know, musician, scholar, kind of bon vivant and man of letters kind of guys. He was always the smartest guy in the room. Just ask anybody who had a party with him. But uh, he did some amazing things on the piano and he understood music. His approach to it was somewhat cerebral, maybe a little bit, a little bit pedantic sometimes, but his Goldberg Variations is a justly famous recording, quite, quite different from Glenn Gould, but no less, I think, articulate in its, in its exposition of what the music is doing and its adaptation to it at the keyboard. So Charles Rosen is worth considering. Then we have, oh, this is our sleeper recording. This was a very strong recommendation of Jed Disler at ClassicsToday.com. And I recommend very, very strongly that you go to ClassicsToday.com and read Jed's review because this is a wonderful performance, very inexpensive. It's Ekaterina, oh yeah, Ekaterina Dershavina on Arte Nova. That's what this is, yes, Arte Nova Classics. Cheap, cheap, fabulous, fabulous. She's a wonderful, wonderful pianist, incredibly sensitive, probing and intelligent recording uh, on the piano. Marvelous. And probably you haven't heard of her and you don't know this recording. So if you're a Goldberg Variations person, you're going to want to hear this. And this one lasts, what, 77 minutes. I need to go back for a second. Um, Charles Rosen is about the same as Pariah. I think he's about like 73, 74 minutes, something in there, but uh, or close enough to it. Wait, what is it? Here it is. Ah, oh, there it is. Yeah, 74 and change. And this is 77 and change. So we're getting back to someone who observes all the repeats and does the whole, the whole shebangy as Bach originally conceived it. But like I said, repeats are always a, a matter of personal taste. And it's worth pointing out that you know, one of the ways in which you can interpret the work is how you group the variations and what the pattern of tension and release is between them and amongst them in these groups and how you handle repeats is part of how you shape an interpretation. So it's very legitimate not to take all the repeats. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. It depends on the audible results. And Ekaterina Dershavina does a beautiful, beautiful job with the Goldbergs. And then, let's see, who else have we got? Oh, yes, Beatrice Rana, the fabulous young Italian pianist. This is another recording that got a tremendous amount of press when it first came out. It's on Warner, and she's a splendid pianist, an incredibly gifted pianist. This is a very sensitive version of the Goldberg Variations. It doesn't go nuts in terms of in terms of virtuosity, but it also is extremely well plan planned and it really exploits the dynamic range of the piano as opposed to the harpsichord. A beautiful performance and it's another complete one, 77 minutes and 45 seconds. So go someplace that takes that long to get to and you can enjoy this one. Finally, at the end of the piano universe, it's 79 minutes and 50 seconds. Whoa! We have Pavel Kolesnikov. This is a somewhat controversial recording. Our own Jed Disler wasn't too thrilled with it. My buddy Christoph Hus loved it. I tend to be more with Christoph. I think it has some very, very interesting ideas. Jed was particularly put off by some of the kind of pseudo mystical spaciness that uh, Kolesnikov brings to, for example, the final Quodlibet. A Quodlibet, by the way, is just a collection of popular tunes. And the last variation of this is a, a Quodlibet, a contrapuntal kind of mishmash 
of popular tunes. They're very, very catchy. You'll recognize them instantly. I mean, you won't recognize what the words are, but you, they, they sound like do, 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 do. But, you know, it's, it's catchy. Very, very catchy. And he plays this in a very dreamy, spacey kind of way that leads very nicely to the concluding aria, which is always played in kind of a dreamy and spacey kind of way. It's a repeat of the initial aria on which the variations are based. And I think this Hyperion recording is, is very, very beautiful and different from the others. And that's the point, because if you're driving back and forth listening to the Goldberg variations, you want to have a maximum variety. Here's a great opportunity to get to know the work really, really well by hearing many, many different approaches to it, because it's just a bigger work than any single approach can encompass. And that's a great way to do it. So that covers piano versions. Now we talk about harpsichord versions. First amongst the harpsichord versions is, ah, Susanna Ruzichkova, the amazing Czech harpsichordist who did the complete Bach keyboard works, the first person ever to do them, all of them. Uh, this is the one that's on Erato. She did the Goldberg Variations more than once. There's another one on Superfun, which is downloadable. The LP or the CD is not available anymore, but you can download it, and it's also splendid. She is not so much into repeats. She gets through the entire work in about oh, 59 minutes, which I think is a perfect hour of driving bliss. So Ruzichkova, whether on Erato or Superfun, is definitely worth having if you want a harpsichord version. And quite frankly, quite frankly, I know people have very strong opinions one way or another. But first of all, harpsichords are better in cars than pianos because they have less dynamic range and you don't lose anything in the traffic noise as long as you're not doing what I did and playing 30 Scarlatti sonatas in a row, which will make you crazy. The Goldberg variations have different pattern of tension and release, fast and slow. So it doesn't make you crazy when it's on a harpsichord, especially if you have an interesting or a good sounding one. And that's, of course, very, very important. So do listen to it both ways, both on the piano and on a keyboard instrument of Bach's time, because the music sounds quite different. And the interpretive approaches are going to be different depending on what instrument you play it on. Another one on the harpsichord that I love, I've always loved, this is really one of my personal favorites, Trevor Pinnock, a very, very smart interpretation. It lasts exactly an hour, 60 minutes and a few seconds. It's just perfect for that, that one hour trip or the hour on the subway or whatever it is. It's really great. And it has a very, very smart approach to repeats. Some of them he chooses to do, some of them he doesn't choose to do, but it's always very, very well motivated musically and very expressively apt the way he does it, I think. And he has a lovely sounding harpsichord. It's a classic version that was released on DG Archive. It, then it became one of those DG Originals, and it's, it's just great. Trevor Pinnock is a very fine keyboard player. He also did a magnificent version of the Bach Partitas. Um, for Hensler, I believe, that are really, really worth hearing too. He's an excellent keyboard artist who didn't do a lot of keyboard recordings because we know him as, as a conductor of, you know, one of those those period instrument groups, the English Concert or the, the something or others. You know, I think it's the English Concert. And he, he did some wonderful, wonderful conducting as well. But this is a gorgeous, gorgeous Goldberg Variations. Oops, knock that out. Next... Oh, this is one I have a sample of. I've got some samples to play. You're going to have some fun with these. This one is on Naxos. This is this is period instrument specialist Wolfgang Rübsam, the German guy. He's a Baroque specialist, and and he's playing a lute harpsichord. Now, a lute harpsichord is just what it sounds like. It's a two manual. It has two keyboards, and one of them is lute sounds, and one of them is harpsichord sounds. And you can mix and match them as you please. And boy, does this sound unlike any other Goldberg variation you will ever hear in your life. I have here 
three different versions of the same variation. Number 14, which I particularly like because it's it's quite zippy and fun to listen to, and it runs the entire range of the keyboard. So you can really, really hear what the instrument sounds like. And this version of the 14th variation is like none other you're ever going to hear. It's really, really wacky on a lute harpsichord. Here it is. Bizarre, huh? Mm -hmm. That's going to be a version for you to experiment with on your on your journeys while you're in your car or wherever you're traveling. It really does wake you up and keep you alert. And particularly if you know this work, you will be very interested to hear it interpreted this way. This performance lasts 78 minutes and 24 seconds, which may be too much lute harpsichord for some people, but I think it's definitely worth hearing. Another great version, one that I've always just loved, if you can still get it, it's well worth having. It's a little bit longer than the lute harpsichord one, or really the same, the same length, 79 minutes is this? Yeah. Or 78, well, about 78, 79 minutes. Maggie Cole. Maggie Cole is just a wonderful, wonderful keyboard artist. This one, one is on Virgin, Virgin Ver, Ver, Veritas, their early music label back in the day. Virgin Classics, remember that? Virgin Veritas, it was bought by EMI, which was bought by Warner. So if it still exists, it's on Warner. But whether they're still using a Virgin Veritas imprint, I don't know. The important thing to remember is that the harpsichordist is Maggie Cole, and she's absolutely terrific. This is one of the great Goldbergs. It really is. Then, if you really want to stretch it out, this one I can't believe. I find this fascinating because it's just, it's really kind of slow. Um, it has all the repeats, obviously. It's on two discs. It's 85 minutes and 39 seconds. That is a long Goldberg. Jory Vinicor. Wonderful, wonderful harpsichord. It's another really first-rate artist. This is on Delos. And if you need to spend 85 minutes, if your trip is going to take you an hour and a half, roughly, here's one you can try on Delos with some very, very interesting approaches to tempo and phrasing. And you can see from the photo that the Goldberg Variations is written for a harpsichord with two keyboards. That's, that's deliberate. And Bach indicates for each variation if it should be played on a single keyboard or on two keyboards. All of it is playable on a single keyboard if you have a piano or if you have a harpsichord of sufficient range, but, but it makes certain things that you need to do somewhat easier if your hands aren't getting in the way of each other. So that's the way that Bach imagined it. And that's a lovely picture, actually, of um, what a harpsichord with two keyboards looks like. And Jory Vinicor is just a terrific harpsichordist. He really is. So that's interesting and interesting tempo-wise. Now, here is a really, really unusual version. Oh, my. This is the Goldberg vari Variations arranged for organ by Wilhelm Middelschulte. Now, Wilhelm Middelschulte was a German composer. He was one of those sort of cranky old German organ guys, romantic guys. He lived from, from let's see here, 1863 to 1943. Yes, there you go. Nobody much cares about him now. He's kind of like Rager or, or you know, Siegfried Karg Ellert. 
the harmonium composer par excellence. These were names that meant something back in the day that don't mean much now, but this is volume four of his organ works, and he did, he arranged the entire Goldberg variations for organ. Now, playing this work on an organ is very problematic because Bach really intended a harpsichord. It is harpsichord music in the sense that, that you need to have a certain, a certain, um, how shall I say, <laughs> clarity of line that organs have a problem doing. It's, it's, it's a rhythmic thing. You know, organs, organs don't do rhythm. And there's, there's, there, even in a harpsichord, there's a relationship between the articulation of the fingers and the way that the, the strings are plucked that you can sort of vary a little bit on the organ, not so much. Also, an organ is a huge, swimmy acoustic, usually. And so, and so you wind up having the thing sound like mud. And the only way you prevent it from sounding like mud is to slow it down enormously. Really, really slow it down so you hear the contrapuntal lines. But then when you do that, the piece becomes incredibly tedious and boring. And this performance, I'm not going to say it's incredibly tedious and boring, is on the CPO label. It is performed by Jürgen Zonenthal, who I mentioned just recently because he's the guy who did the complete Zelenka orchestral music, which is wonderful. And he's a crack organist, but this performance takes 101 plus minutes. 101 minutes. That's an hour and 40 minutes. That is really, really slow. And here, just to show you, is that same 14th variation, only now performed at a grindingly slow, and I might add loud, and I might add contrapuntally foggy pace by Jürgen Sonnenthal on the organ. Brace yourself, folks. <laughs> So you may have noticed that that performance I did not find particularly appealing, but you may, I don't know. And it does last an hour and 40 minutes. And if you're in your car for an hour and 40 minutes and want to hear a Goldberg variations like no other, you may want to give that one a shot. It will certainly, it will certainly spark your interest. And I think it will probably hold your attention if only because you will be horrified and infuriated at what you're hearing as often as not. However, my final choice is also just a real favorite of mine. It's a fantastic performance um, and by a, a wonderful, wonderful harpsichordist who I've spoken of before in connection with her magnificent recordings of keyboard works of CPE Bach. And I'm talking about Christine Schornsheim. She's just, just great. But yeah, she has two things going for her. First of all, she's a very smart, very knowledgeable and very musical interpreter. And second of all, she almost always picks a lovely instrument and has it very well recorded. She cares about what her stuff sounds like. And that is a big, big deal, especially in the period instrument movement, where too many people let the instrument do the interpreting for them. And they don't seem to care about beauty of tone. They think whatever foul sounding monstrosity they're playing, whatever ugly tone they emit must be authentic if they're following certain rules. She's not like that. She's a real artist. I mean, a serious keyboard artist. And you can hear that in her version of the 14th variation, the way that she's able to, to use 
agogics, that is slight hesitations, slight distensions of the line without ever breaking the backbone of the rhythm. She interprets without being disfiguring or mannered or unnatural. She just knows what she's doing. And it's a beautiful, beautiful sounding recording. And there's more. But first, let me play you this 14th variation. It'll clean your ears after hearing that organ thing. Absolutely beautiful. But this set also comes with an amazing little work by Dietrich Buxtehude. Remember Buxtehude? That's the guy in Lübeck. Bach, you know, went there to hear him. He walked like 200 miles and, and overstayed his, his leave of absence like three months. He didn't want to go home. And, and Buxtehude was the guy who, when, you know, who, who everybody wanted his job, but in order to get his job, he had to marry his daughter, whose name was Euphrodisia Buxtehude. I'm just kidding. Her name was Anna and she was getting old and everybody tried out for the job. You know, Handel was there and Matheson was there and Telemann was there. They all took one look at what the deal was and left. And finally, finally, you know, Buxtehude found somebody, found somebody to actually marry his daughter, Anna. And as soon as that happened, Lubeck ceased to become a musical capital of any note in northern Germany, which is which is kind of sad, actually. But in any case, Buxtehude was a magnificent composer. He was the generation before Bach. And he also wrote this fantastic, fantastic 32 variations on Aria La Capricciosa. That's what it's called, Aria La Capricciosa. It's about 25 minutes long, and it has 32 variations on an original tune. And it makes the perfect coupling to the Goldberg variations. So this version of the Goldberg variations is, you know, about 78, 79 minutes, but you get another 25 minutes worth from Buxtehude. So you can you can play both if you have a particularly long journey. You can do up to 105 minutes of travel, or you can just listen to the Buxtehude for 25 minutes, or the Bach for about 80 minutes. It's absolutely marvelous. And this is on Capriccio. And again, it's Christine Schornsheim. There she is. Take a look, write it down. And she's a wonderful, wonderful Bach pianist. She also did an excellent, well-tempered clavier. She's just a terrific, terrific artist. So those are my 15 choices for the Goldberg Variations when you're on the road. You can also listen to them just as easily when you're not on the road. But I think, I think there's something appropriate about it because, you know, it's kind of like the original purpose that Bach intended. Something captivating, something ear catching that's going to keep you alert when you are otherwise either unable to rest or unable to sleep because you'll get, you know, you'll drive off a bridge or kill somebody. Either way, there's something I think appropriate in using the Goldberg variations, not just sitting there, you know, like this, you know, it's reverently and in awe, letting the Goldbergedness wash over you, like we're all supposed to when we listen to Bach. You know, we're supposed to be like like deer in the headlights, just going, Bach, oh my God, it's Bach, it's the Goldberg variations. No! Use them. Make them part of your life. Let them let them serve a purpose that is more than just, you know, sitting there, sitting there with this sort of pseudo religious. I, I, I don't know. I'm not into that. You, you know that you folks who know me know that that just irritates the crap out of me. I think this is healthy, humane, expressive music that should be part of our lives. And Bach thought that way too. That was the way he operated. And we should have every opportunity to use his music and exploit it for that marvelously practical purpose. So keep on listening, folks. Happy motoring. Take care.